day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Aren't you glad to be here on this Lord's Day? Thank you, choir, for reminding us of multiple messages today in our worship. And for those of you who read the scripture and prayed prayers and have given witness to the resurrected Christ, we are grateful for that. While you're standing, open God's word to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 5. The last paragraph in Mark's gospel. Beginning at verse 35, concluding at verse 41. You have that? All right. It reads, the disciples were in a storm with Jesus and they passed out. This is the word of God. You may be seated. I'll show you that in a moment so nobody will <laughs> criticize me of extra biblical material, you know. <clears throat> in storms with Jesus. In 1966, 80 miles away from the coast of New York, the SS Michelangelo was trying to make its way to the city. Thousands of people were waiting on its arrival. 775 passengers were on board. And everything was moving according to schedule. When out of nowhere, a rogue wave broke across the prow of the ship, ripping through the hull a gaping gash to the side. 80 feet above the sea line were the double glass plated windows that had been blown out. Beneath it, 70 feet above sea, the steel railings that held it in place had been ripped apart. When the people were asked about this wave, they merely said, it bounced us around like a rubber ball, up and down, side to side, doing with us whatever it pleased. As a result, two passengers died. One crew member was fatally wounded and of course died. And the rest made it safe to shore. The SS Michelangelo stands as an example, a demonstration even, that man can split an atom, but you can't control a storm. <laughs> there are people in this room this morning that know that statement existentially. They've lived it, they've encountered it. Storms have literally altered their very existence of life. That you can put a man on an outer planet. Meteorologists can predict the coming of a storm, even the size of the storm, but it can't control the storm. One of the reasons why we read the Bible, and I think Christians will become more excited about gathering in church, if we could pay the same acute attention to the purpose of our coming, the way we plan to go see Beyonce. <laughs> P. 
people chose uniforms, made travel arrangements, dinner arrangements, after party events. And week after week, we'll gather in a place like this and we're bored, we're disengaged, we say it's indifferent, and it's not, it's just you don't prepare for what's going to take place on Sunday morning. Jesus, and this is not a throwaway statement, by the way, it's not a complaint. Jesus invited the disciples in chapter 4 to take a ride with him. And so, in this journey, this story is actually tailored to teach us something about the progressive, successive demonstration of God's power. In chapter 4, this is just now some Bible study tools to help you when you're reading this to say, what's the big deal? We, we know what you're going to say about this story. Do you? Up to this point, you don't know. Because I didn't know. Jesus shows us four areas where he's in control through his power. In chapter 5, you remember he commandeers a boat. He's about to be crushed by a crowd. These gaggle Galileans gather around him. And so he pushes away from the shore to teach. And it's a picture of his control or power over the populace of the people. Remember the statement, progressive, successive demonstration over certain things. Then you come to verse 35, and it is the demonstration of God's power over a storm. Chapter 5 introduces us to a man of Gadara, one of my favorite people in all of the Bible, and it reveals God's power over the demonic. And then there's a woman who has an issue with blood for 12 years. She has depleted her resources. She heard if I could touch the hem of Jesus' garment, I could be whole. And she did. And Jesus showed that he had power over diseases. While that's going on, simultaneously, a father intercedes on behalf of his daughter, Jairus. My daughter is 12 and at home sick. By the time Jesus gets there, Jesus is always late. <laughs> she had died. And the people that should have known better were laughing when Jesus got there and he does, he puts them out of the house. Speaks words over the daughter. Said, eat a fish sandwich. Literally. Because dead people don't eat. And so she eats. And now he shows that he has power over death. Now, the purpose of this power is not for us to become silly in our faith. To build formulas. If you do this and this and that, then God is going to do this, this and that. You don't know how God's going to operate. The story is not for you or me to build a formula on. It is to be reminded that there is no part of life, nature, nature, the demonic, even death, that God is ever out of control. Yeah. Remember the statement, progressive successes demonstration. So you move further into the story. 
and it gives us a clue to how miracles work. I believe in miracles. I, I believe in miracles. That doesn't matter whether you believe in them or not. You don't have to. You're probably a person who says, that's why Pastor Wes and I don't ride together. I don't believe in supernatural events. There, there's a whole lot of Christians like that. I happen to believe that the God who created the universe, raised Jesus from the dead, has the power to control the visible and the invisible. And I'm not an anti-intellectual. That is, I understand all of the tools necessary. And I hold to a critical interpretation of the scripture. I happen to believe that the God of the Bible, through his revelation, that God is able to do what God has done. I don't believe that it ended at the coming of the Holy Spirit. I, don't, I, I believe God is still God. I'm going somewhere. And I believe in miracles because I saw the biggest miracle in my life just a couple of years ago. Not the miracle of his resurrection, I know that by faith. Not the miracle of his crucifixion, I know that through biblical faith. I'm talking about, I saw a miracle. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There was a cell, a disease, a germ that you couldn't even see with your naked eye. That broke loose around the world. Whether its origin is Asia, all I know is when it got to America in the Pacific Northwest, it started breaking out. And, and, and it, was, it was just all over the place. And I saw with my own eyes, millions of people who died. I, I shed more tears over people I didn't know because as the poet says, any man's death diminishes me. I'm involved in mankind. Therefore do not for ask whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And so my participation in humanity caused me to weep and then I wept over those who could not celebrate the life of their families the way that they were accustomed to doing it. I had to do funerals like that. Two years into it, these brilliant young men and women in research, in laboratories, came up with a vaccine that if you take it, and enough people take it, it could mitigate this virus that had been killing people. And I saw it with my own eyes and said, it's a miracle. You have to be careful who you listen to. I respect everybody, but now, just because you're an NFL player, just because you're a hipster, a, a, a rapper, an artist, made some movies, doesn't make you an expert in the field of medicine. I know this is hard for you, you can criticize Jesus, but you can't cr complain against your favorite person. I saw this miracle. I witnessed a medical miracle around HIV AIDS. I buried men and women in my church who had been touched by that. And today, that disease lives on the plane of somebody who has diabetes. That is the result of God still working miracles. And Jesus worked a miracle this, on this particular day. He gave them in early on, he said, now this is how the kingdom grows. Now come take a ride with me. Because people could wear you out and Jesus was peopled out. He had communicated, some had received, there was reception, positive and negative to his reception. There was opposition on the other hand, but then there's always exhaustion. 
And Jesus was tired. And for you super saints here today, it's all right to get tired. I'm probably talking to some pastor now who, who, who brags, I've never taken a vacation. Shame on you. You did something that God didn't do. He worked seven days and said, I'm going to get me some rest. And if the Lord of the universe can take a time out, you ought to be able to take a time out. You ain't that important. And I'm going to tell you, life will continue on when you go. Jesus said, come go with me on a, on a ride. His disciples are backing away. They're getting on the boat. And uh, Jesus is saying, it's, it's time for us, us to go. How do you know this is true, Pastor West? Because not just because I read it, but because Eusebius of, Sy of Syria says, Caesarea says that, and he was a historian, he wrote this down. And he simply said that John Mark probably was getting his story from the big fisherman Peter some 30 years down the road. That's how we tell stories. You go to the family reunion and somebody starts spinning a yarn and you say, we better write that down. And every year, somebody, that's what Peter did. He started telling the story. This is how you know as our witness. You don't have to guess at it, even if you don't have a high view of the scripture. I mean, if you can believe the writings of Shakespeare, you can be the scripture. And so here's how you pick it up that day. Oh, people who tell stories, they remember that day. When evening, that is, that day evening, we getting ready to hear a story. He said to his disciples, that's what Peter said. He said, that day evening, Jesus was talking and he said this, let's go over on the other side. Why? That's why I love preaching to you. Stay with it. They're on one side of the lake. On the north side where Mount Hermon is, they're going to go over to the east side. Now, the, the lake is only 17 miles long. It's about five and a half, six, maybe seven and a half miles wide. It's 680 feet below sea level. It sits in the basin of Mount Hermon over here, and in the southwest is the desert. Snow-capped mountains over here. That's why when you read the Bible, that the geography is important for people to say, y'all didn't read some, some man said, whoever wrote it detailed for us that this is not some place that it didn't happen. You can trace cartography today and say, that go Herman, that go the lake, that go the desert, and whenever coal and heat get together, there's always something getting ready to happen. And so now you have them coming up, coming, getting on the ship, making their way across the lake. Come on, let's go. Everybody get on. Go on to the other side. Let's go. These people were familiar with taking this boat ride. This wasn't nothing new. I mean, they've been sea tested, I guess you could say it that way. And they're on their way to the other side. And on their way over, across, suddenly, these are words that Mark loved to play with. Immediately, suddenly, Storms show up. Wind is howling. There's a squalling wind. The skies are dark. Suddenly, storm. Now, it's one thing to know when a storm is coming and you can border up the house. Or the meteorologists say, get out of town. You got to be gone by Thursday. That, that's one thing. It's something else to be on the journey and no warning and all hell break loose. One phone call. 
one doctor's visit, one report, and you say, I wish that I didn't know what Pastor West was talking about. Just one call changes your entire world forever. Storms come. Now I'm aware of who I'm preaching to. I'm one of your many pastors who you listen to, who has told you you don't listen to what he says because Christians don't have storms. That if you live by faith, then you are storm exempt. I know some of these people and I wish I, sometimes Sometimes I got to watch who I let push me. Because one of my faith friends went through a serious bout. And I said, I guess you didn't have enough faith that day, huh? He said, don't play with me like that. I said, trust me, I ain't playing. Because all them years you have taught your people if they have faith, they'll always have and go down the list. And now that you have what you complain, are you bold enough to stand up to them and say, I got it wrong. You can love God with all of your heart and storms can still come. I'm trying to help somebody now. You are not exempt from storm. How big your Bible is under your arm. I don't care what kind of material your cross is made out of. I don't care how many times you pray a day, a week, read the scripture. You are not exempt from storm. And really, I only have one point in the sermon, and that is, if you follow Jesus faithfully and trust him obediently, you will have a storm. I don't know what kind of storm, but you can name it family storm, financial storm, storm of the faith, domestic storm, educational storm, political storm. Storms just keep on coming. And I wish I could tell you, you only have one storm. Sometimes storms are cyclical, that when you get out of one storm, God has a way of leading you to another storm. But remember, storm or not, he has the power to control the storm. Come on, let's go over. I'm almost done now. Come on now. Let's go on over. And they're on the ship trying to make their way. And a storm breaks out. Rocking that ship from side to side. And you start wondering, I, I asked earlier today, and it was, uh, Tom was here, Smith, who's a military man. Any of you ever been in a, I'm talking about like, on a boat in a storm? A lot of y'all, you want to do it again? I don't, I've been in a storm like that. I know I got to die, but I don't, I don't want to leave away from home. No, I'm serious. And we were out in the Mediterranean and uh, the wind comes across those mountains. <sighs> and that boat was rocking and it wasn't big enough. It's one thing to be an ocean liner. Something else to be in a boat <laughs> that you can see from one end to the next. <laughs> and do you not know my children was on that, and that frightened me more. And then something happened. And then I was concerned about it. That boat started really rocking. And Ralph had the nerve to say these words. I'm sleepy. <laughs> and he went to sleep in the storm. <laughs> Psalm 4 and 8 reminds us that we can rest in the storm because God is our safety. 
Come on now. I ain't through yet. I'm still there. So the storm is breaking up and it's rocking from one side to the other. And then the disciples, the disciples uh, get nervous because, uh, you know, they get nervous. And uh, they said, uh, look around and said, uh, <laughs> where is the one who invited us on this ride? And they went and found him and said, he's sleep in the boat. And uh, they said, wait a minute, but he's the one that invited us on the ship to take the ride. And he's sleep. And he's sleep. And you know why? He's sleep because he's the Lord over the storm. H have you ever played off of Jonah and Jesus, that, that, that Jonah went to sleep in a storm too. Jesus was sleep, but not. He's fully human and divine. So he sleep, but he not sleep, but he sleep. Jonah got on a ship and went to sleep because he disobeyed God. Jesus got on a ship, went to sleep because he was living in the obedience of God's will. Jonah got on a boat, went to sleep because without God, he was heading in the wrong direction. Jesus got on the ship, went to sleep because he was going where God had already told him to go. And when you go in God's direction, you can go to sleep. <laughs> yes, you can. I'm trying to get us to the other side. And, and, and so by this time, listen to what the disciples said. Uh, King James, Master, cares not that we perish. I like that. Cares not that we perish. Uh, Moffat's translation, Lord, you don't care if we drown. I, I know that the storm looks so devastating that you think you're getting ready to go under. But if God is on the ship with you, God has a way of controlling the storm to teach you the lessons that come from the storm. Look, I got to go. I, I can tell y'all can't take much more of this, but my soul is happy because at this moment, the storm has come. And look what happens. The wind is blowing and the waves are in the ship. And so when the wind blows and the waves come, read it, Jesus now has been summoned by the disciples. There's a line in this story. There's a line in it. Did you read it? It wasn't just Jesus and the disciples. It was other boats that didn't have Jesus on board. But if you're following Jesus on board or not, he got you covered. I just put it in that kind of vernacular. He got you covered. And so here they are going on, master, Care is not that we perish. And Jesus talked to two things. He said, let me speak to the wind. And then let me speak to the wave. You remember they're going across to the other side to do what Jesus had been doing on this side, on the west side. Now he's going to the east side to do what he had been doing on the west side. And so what he's going to do is what he's been doing in chapters 1, 2, and 3, and most of 4. And so Jesus has stake on getting to where he's going. So when they say, care is not, he said, what you mean? I've already given you my resume. You've been with me enough to know that I got power over nature. I have already turned water into wine. 
I know how to speak to the wind. I was before the wind came into existence. The wind knows my voice. It knows how to behave. And so he said, hush. And look what happened. The wind stopped blowing. It's the same word that you read in chapter one and the same word in chapter five when Jesus speaks to the demoniac or to the demons and he said, hush. He said, let me muzzle your mouth. Stop talking. No more negativity. No more talking about what I cannot do. I am God and I am in control. No, I'm trying to stop y'all but my soul. Because I'm trying to help somebody understand that God got you in your storm. Uh, One more. And then he speaks to the waves. Because the waves are flowing into the ship. And so Jesus doesn't just speak to the wind. Because those who have been out on those seas know that the wind can stop blowing. But the waves can keep on threatening. So when Jesus says, quiet be still is the word we get locked off he just cut it off it didn't die down it stopped in a second because when God works his work God knows how to stop it when he says it. wait I'm done have a good day last thing I just got to ask one question why y'all ain't got no faith read it that's why I told you, keep it up. It's in there. Why don't you have any faith? I've given you enough to look at. I've given you enough to see. All you got to do is exercise your faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But you must believe that God is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. Faith can move mountains. Faith, yeah, can turn life around. Faith can shut the mouth of hungry lions take the heat out of the flame faith where is your faith I'm not talking about some cheap faith I ain't talking about name it and claim it Uh, name it and blame it mumble and babble I ain't talking about that I'm talking about trust in God wherever I may be Out on the land or on the stormy sea, billows may roll. Uh, uh, But the Lord can keep my soul. My heavenly Father watches over me. And let me tell you what you do. The next time you get in a storm, my best friend, old Rufus, like to ride these roller coasters. And Rufus knows that's not my thing. But Ruth said, man, let me tell you, number one, storms don't last. He said, roller coaster rides are only one and a half minutes long. And all you need to do is strap in and enjoy the ride. Have a good day. May God bless you real good. And on my way to heaven, that's what I decided to do. I'm a strap in and I'm going to enjoy the ride. I didn't say that the ride wasn't dangerous. I didn't say that the ride was fearful. I didn't say that the ride wasn't scary. I said, I'm going to strap in and I'm going to enjoy the ride. Have a good day now, children. May God bless you real good. But though the storms keep on raging in my life, and though sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day, 
but my hope within is reassured. Have I got a witness here? My hope within is reassured that if I keep my eyes on the distant shore, I know he will lead me safely to that blessed place he has prepared. Have a good day now, children. May God bless you real good. But why don't you stop in and enjoy the ride? Because your soul has been a God. A God. A God in the Lord. Have I got a witness here? Is there anybody here? Tried my deal. Won't he be your anchor? Let the redeem of the Lord say so. Yeah. 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 My soul been anchored. My soul been anchored. Get old may roll. Break as may dash. I cannot sleep. Because he hold me fast. Come on. So dark a day. Clouds in the sky. I know it's going to be all right. Because Jesus is my, my soul. My soul. <laughs> My soul, your soul has been anchored in the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Come on, celebrate his goodness today. If you know that the Lord can do all of that. He's our calm in the storm. Storms may come, but he's our calm in the storm. Lord, thank you for the picture and the reminder of who Jesus is and what he's able to do. That following you might lead us into a storm, but if you're there with us, we know we have the assurance of the calm in the storm. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, our rock and redeemer, we pray. Lord, move upon the hearts of people. May we not grieve your Holy Spirit or quench him. And for those of us in Christ, in Christ, May we renew our faith. Some of us have been through some tough storms, Lord. If it had not been for faith, we couldn't have made it. So be with us now. Be with us. In the name of Jesus, all God's people say amen. Come on. Yeah. Give him glory. Yeah.